Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Seaweed Brain, a Percy Jackson podcast. We are not live from the duad. For those of you who have stuck with us through the Red Pyramid, <gasps> the Red Pyramid is on on ice, on pause. You know, we're we're leaving Carter and Sadie. Oh gosh, where in Memphis? In Memphis, we're leaving them in Memphis to celebrate a new release and also a new casting announcement. Woohoo! So we'll be talking about the Wrath of the Triple Goddess today. Woo-hoo! Stick around. <laughs> Seaweed Brain live from the Bay Area coming at you for some, I want to say Berkeley themed, but it literally isn't Berkeley themed content. It is like Berkeley ambitious, Berkeley aspirational content. We are here today to talk about the wrath of the triple goddess. If you are popping in here as a new person, I'm Erica, I'm the co host, joined as always by my co host, Carter. Hello. Hi. We've been doing this podcast for a really long time, and we are so thrilled to be reading a brand new book right now. We're going to start just the first couple chapters today and get our feet wet with the second book in what is apparently being dubbed The Senior Year Adventures, which is really exciting. Isn't that new? This is new, right? I don't remember this That was the moniker. first thing that gagged me when I picked up the book. And since we are still live from the Bay Area, we are in the same room. So if we start talking over each other and the audio gets weird, that's why. Authenticity. Authenticity. I will also say it's giving 100 degrees right now in my Airbnb, and we are like, (laughs) we are sweating. (laughs) The third warm day of the year in San Francisco today. Even though it's like the second day of fall. Also, triple also, triple goddess. It is Monday, September 23rd. So um, I am going to attend one of the virtual book events tomorrow night. And then this episode is going to come out the day after that. So we will maybe cover some of the content coming out of the virtual book tour events next week, even though technically they will have already happened by the time that you are listening to this episode. Okay. So this morning I woke up to some amazing news. (laughs) (laughs) That's the great thing about being on West Coast time is that when everybody gets on Twitter and starts teasing that information is going to drop today, you don't have to sit and wait around for it. You just wake up and And the information is already there. (laughs) Um, So (laughs) we got the casting for Talia Grace today. Yay! Our Talia Grace is Tamara Smart. She is, I believe, a young 19-year-old actress. She's from the UK. And I am going to read what Rick posted on his blog, which is literally just a copy-paste press release from (laughs) Disney Plus. Because our wonderful Myth and Magic producers are doing a great job of um, really staying in the the lines. Locked in. PR and message. NDAs, (laughs) yes. Here is the official announcement. Demigods, the wait is over. Disney Plus has officially announced that Tamara Smart from Resident Evil will join the cast of Percy Jackson and the Olympians. Something that I don't think is mentioned in this press release is she was also in the Disney Plus Artemis Fowl. Tamara Smart will join the cast of Percy Jackson and the Olympians as the beloved character Talia Grace, daughter of the sky god Zeus. Smart will appear as a recurring guest star in season two of the Epic Adventure series alongside series regulars Walker Scobell, Leah Save Jeffries, Arian Samadri, Charlie Bushnell, Dior Goodjohn, and Daniel Deemer. It's giving ensemble cast. Season two of Percy Jackson and the Olympians is based on the Sea of Monsters. The second installment in Disney Hyperion's best-selling Percy Jackson book series by acclaimed author Rick Riordan. Talia is the demigod daughter of Zeus who made her last stand to protect her friends at the edge of camp Half-Blood. Rather than let her die, Zeus transformed her into a tree that anchors the force field that protects camp. Tough and prickly, Talia is fiercely loyal to her friends and distrustful of her father's world. That's interesting. Yeah, distrustful of her father's world. That seems like a sharper characterization of her personal belief system than we had at this point in the books. And by this point, I mean before we meet her. Yeah, that to me sounds like the copy pasted um, character description. From even though I never, call. yeah, even <laughs> though I never saw a breakdown for this role, I would assume that that is what the was written in the breakdown. Riordan added, "Quote." Talia Grace is one of the most important characters in the Percy Jackson universe, so the right casting was critical. Talia is a powerful warrior, a fiercely loyal friend, and a demigod rebel with a very punk, rage-against-the-machine sensibility. As soon as we saw Tamara Smart play this role, we knew we had found our daughter of Zeus. She was, no pun intended, electric. Tamara puts the grace in Talia Grace. Smart's connection to the role of Talia is especially poignant, as she previously worked alongside the late Lance Reddick, who portrayed Zeus in the first season of the Disney Plus original series. Coincidentally, Smart also played Reddick's daughter in that previous project. Reflecting on the connection Smart shared, quote, I'm so grateful and excited to be joining the cast of Percy Jackson and the Olympians. It's so close to my heart. Lance Reddick and I always spoke about working together again, so it's that much more special and important to me to play his daughter once more as Talia and to keep his memory alive. I feel his presence all around me and strive to make him proud on this exciting journey." End quote. 
From Disney branded television and 20th television production on season two of the Disney Plus original series is currently underway in Vancouver for a 2025 debut on Disney Plus. Meanwhile, the first season of Percy Jackson and the Olympians is available on Disney Plus. <laughs> Yay! And then Rick even linked the media kit um, on this blog post. <laughs> so you can click on the official press site and download all of the, you know, official images, which is really helpful for <laughs> fan content creators, to be honest. Um, okay, yay! Are you on her Wikipedia right now, Carter? I'm trying to determine <laughs> in which project she played oh, Lance's daughter. I believe it's Resident it? Evil. Oh, okay. Yeah. She was also in Wendell and Wild? Wait, go back. <laughs> yeah, it was Resident Evil. Mm. Okay. It's cool that she's a guest star, which means she will be appearing in multiple episodes this season in Percy, what we assume obviously is Percy's flashbacks and then what we assume also is the very end of the final episode, probably. Yeah, yeah. In real time. Is there a union contract stipulation about how many episodes or what percentage or think guest star is? Yes, there is. I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but a guest star is bigger than a co-star. A co-star is what you would think of as having like one appearance in an episode with like three lines. Mm. For example, like Jason Manzukis was a guest star last season. Okay, okay, that's a helpful benchmark. There'll probably be a flashback, that makes sense. There's gonna be multiple flashbacks, yeah. yeah. I don't feel like my brain has really fully wrapped around the fact that she is Talia yet because it's just, oh, it's just book two, you know, it's just the flashbacks, but we're about to get to know this girl <laughs> for like, for a very, very long time. It sounds like she's gonna be doing press with them for this season then, right? I hope so, yeah. I mean, as much as Charlie and Dior did for season one. Which was a meaningful amount, Which I was think. a meaningful yeah. amount. Yeah, absolutely. It's so wild to think about how Talia, unlike some of our other favorite characters from The Titan's Curse, Talia becomes immortal and is with us for the entire rest of time up until literally, quote unquote, present day Percy Jackson. So yeah. this is a potential 20 year contract for her. <laughs> <laughs> Which is really beautiful. It's exciting. We're excited for her. The first thing I saw about the announcement, to your point earlier yeah. about the teasing of it, I saw the actual announcement and then immediately underneath it, I saw the post of Aryan saying that he was going to reveal the casting and talking to the tree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I hope they had fun with that. Yeah. I had fun with that. Should we shelve Talia Gray's casting for now and look forward to speculating more about her role in season two? After we finish this new era of the podcast, which is to cover the Wrath of the Triple Goddess. That sounds right. Yeah, we'll, we'll look out for any additional interviews or content that they have. But I think that's, that's what we have for now. Yeah, that's what we have for now. So it's Wednesday by the time you're listening to this, which means the Wrath of the Triple Goddess officially came out yesterday. And this is the second book in the senior year adventures, which was not something that existed until <laughs> now, I believe, as like the tagline onto this book, which is very exciting. We know that there's going to be three books in the series, but mm -hmm. I kind of feel like, ooh, what if we get three more books, but from Annabeth's perspective on her senior year adventures, you know, that could be fun. <laughs> in case anyone doesn't remember why these books happened in the first place, I'm going to read a direct quote from a Rick blog post back in May about the senior year adventures. Quote, as you may have read, I pitched three ideas for new Percy books when we were initially trying to entice Disney into making Percy Jackson a TV show. It turned out we didn't need to use those ideas, but once the show was in progress, writing the new books seemed like a good way to celebrate Percy's rebirth with my readers. Rick, I think, has been really vocal about how much Walker, Leah, and Arian's voices have influenced the book versions of these characters. I don't think that there really is a book version versus a TV show version anymore. There's just these characters that are like holistically influenced by their portrayals in the TV show. If you'll remember, The Chalice of the Gods was dedicated to Walker, Leah, and Arian and to mm -hmm. New Beginnings. And this book is dedicated to our friends at 20th TV and Disney Plus. We couldn't imagine a better crew to sail with into the Sea of Monsters. So they're very linked together. Yes. This book with the Sea of Monsters. Historically, in terms of content, in terms mm -hmm. of the character development, marketing, etc. Mostly marketing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like the inception of it as well. Because if you think about it, Rick was finishing edits on this book at the same time that they were furiously writing scripts for season two. Mm -hmm. So you have to imagine that there's a lot of season two. There's a lot of like 12-year-old Percy and Annabeth, or 13? 13? 13-year-old 13 Percy and Annabeth yeah. involved in this version of 17-year-old Percy and Annabeth. Yeah, I think that's fair. Should we should we do a little recap of Chalice? Yes. While we're here. So Chalice is something that takes place 
Oh, this is actually a little bit of a spoiler. We're getting into the chapters. You'll find this out in chapter one. The chapter takes place roughly a month before the events of The Wrath of the Triple Goddess. It is following a quest that Percy undertakes with help from Grover and Annabeth to help recover the stolen chalice of the gods, which Ganymede, the cupbearer god, has lost in order to get a recommendation letter. The three of them also, of course, have to help Iris on a side quest because she had information about it, but we don't get any credit for that. Right. <laughs> you can only get credit for the main god because he didn't previously enroll in dual credit. Yes, you have to pre-specify how many recommendation letters you'll be receiving from a given quest or set of quests. Yeah. And Percy's like amidst also having to get these recommendation letters, having to do so much extra schoolwork to catch up because, of course, Hera memory wipe, disasters yes. of Heroes of Olympus situation. He's to do two years worth of coursework in a year. Mostly so that he can go to college at the same time as Annabeth. They succeeded the quest. Uh, Ganymede is not zapped off of Olympus or whatever. They have that great scene at the end where Percy is tiny and sneaking around underneath moving tables and stuff to get the chalice to Ganymede while Zeus is telling a long story before he asks for wine or ambrosia for the first time. Mm -hmm. It succeeds. We have one recommendation letter. We need three, which is why it's going to be a trilogy. Obviously, the next recommendation letter, as you heard from that fun press release, is going to be from Hecate. Is there anything else that we have to say? About well, now it's book? October, and so it is um, lightly it's spooky. spooky. <laughs> yeah, it's spooky time. It's October in the book. It's October as this is being released. Nearly. Nearly. Oh, yeah. Wow, it is still September. Technically. Technically. It's also Agatha all along season. <laughs> Do you it's think the Disney of the planned witch. that? Do you think Disney... Well, I mean, I guess it's all Halloween themed. But like, wow. Okay. I don't think that there was that much communication between Disney <laughs> Hyperion and Disney branded television, the Marvel sector, about this. But I think it works out brilliantly. And I will be listening to The Ballad of the Witch's Road over and over and over again, starring Patti Lapone while I read this book. <laughs> we just started. I've only read the first three chapters. You've read, what, the first four? Yeah. Okay, so literally we cannot spoil it beyond there. I only think we're going to get to the first two chapters today, but if you haven't finished the book, don't worry. We can't spoil it for you. We haven't finished reading it either. Yes, it's true. We won't be spoiling. We'll be pacing ourselves. We're in New York. Well, a lot of Chalice was about everyone being settled in New York. Grover lives in the city. Annabeth is at a boarding school. I guess we just dive in. If you haven't started reading the book yet, you can tune out here and tune back in once you've read the first couple chapters. Otherwise, we're going to get started now. Boom! Chapter one, I have an accident in the principal's office. We start out by saying, October, best month ever. The air was crisp, the leaves were changing colors in Central Park, and my favorite food cart on 86th Street was serving pumpkin spice burritos. On top of all that, I'd had zero recent trouble from the mythological world. No gods had knocked on my door demanding that I run their errands. No monsters had tried to kill me. For three blissful weeks, I'd been a normal senior in high school. And when you're the demigod son of Poseidon, normalcy is a nice change of pace, even if it comes with a side of homework and weekend tutoring. And then we get all of the backstory. About the weekend tutoring, because he's doing two years worth of coursework at the same time. I, I'm also fascinated by the coursework that he's choosing to do. Dual credit Spanish class on Saturdays and on Sundays, online chemistry class. Online chemistry class? Percy, you have to go to lab. Yeah, what do you, yeah. Do you think he's doing lab like in the living room? Maybe they have a separate lab adjunct or it's like a, at the end of the term, you have to go in once for one really intense weekend of doing yeah. all the labs or something. If there's one thing Carter knows about, it's high school chemistry coursework because Carter was literally the teacher's assistant for multiple years for our high school chemistry department. It's true. It's true. Yeah. Percy, you have to go to lab. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> you need to learn about, you know, tearing and how the meniscus works. And... Oh, God, the meniscus. The amount of terror I felt making sure that the bottom of the meniscus was at the right level, right? Because it's the bottom of the meniscus, not the top of the meniscus. Yeah, that's right. And I think tactile, like, especially, okay, I feel like for Percy, given what we know about his background with school, chemistry is the one class where I think in-person chemistry would be really fun because it is tactile Hands it's visual on. you can see the reaction happening you can smell it you yeah. can hear it i have to say i despised going to chemistry class sophomore year of high school because i hated the fact that it was so hands-on i had to stand up out of my chair you had to move to the benches i had to the move back. to the lab tables we had to do th i was like i just want to fall i was so busy in high school i just wanted to take a little nap you know sit down turn my brain off enjoy the air conditioning but no i had to really learn kinetically with my hands in chemistry. <laughs> so maybe Percy's the same way, you know? He didn't want to deal with all of that because he's so tired. I mean, good for him saving the commute, but also <laughs> I, I just feel like if he was going to pick something to do online, I think that he should have picked 
something else personally yeah. like history class history I yeah be i was thinking history yeah Anyway, anyway. Percy's really busy. Good for him. Academic star. This is my favorite part of the first chapter. Things were so quiet, I fell asleep in English class and didn't realize it until the teacher stood right over me and said, Percy? I jolted awake. Luckily, I didn't draw my sword. Theme! I yelled, because that's the question I'd been preparing to answer before I nodded off. The theme is free will versus fate. Mrs. Foray frowned. The other students tried not to laugh. Your aunt is in the office. Mrs. Foray handed me a note. She's come to pick you up. I mumbled an apology to Mrs. Foray, wiped a jewel off my cheek, and headed for the office. Something told me I'd still be able to use that answer about free will versus fate. It seemed to be the theme of my life. <laughs> I giggled, I cackled. It also made me think of Sea of Monsters a lot. Because of the school room starting scene? No, because obviously it is the theme of his life, so it's present well, yeah. in every single book. But Sea of Monsters is where we see... It's where we get the, the fatal siren flaw. scene, the fatal flaw. It's where Annabeth spoils the great prophecy a little exactly. bit. <laughs> yeah, so I feel like as Rick was thinking about free will versus fate in the context of Sea of Monsters, that makes for a, a funny joke here in particular. Yeah, it is a funny joke specifically because I think there's something about a high school English class that really loves to teach a book <laughs> on free will versus fate, you know? Uh, I don't think there are that many collegiate English classes that are really as interested in the same way or degree or like it'll just be one of them you know everyone has to go through a high school english class where you're spending yeah. the whole time talking about fate versus determinism yeah right where did we do that was that king lear where we really dove into that in high school i think it was our sophomore year we did antigone oh yeah greek tragedy you know mm -hmm. so i guess that that is what is chosen mm -hmm. to to talk about yeah <laughs> and those are the central questions of your life when you are 16, I feel like, as well. For some, yeah. I don't know. When I was 16, I was really irritated with it until, <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I was like, I, I like no physics. Like, I don't need to wonder if everything's predetermined. And the English teacher at the end had to be like, well, you know, like, we haven't said this the whole time, but you, you need to remember that, that when we talk about fate, it, it, it's kind of a metaphor. Like, we, we mean the, the social context of, of your life. You literally said, I know physics. I'm not worried about fate. <laughs> Did you say that? I, I think I didn't say that, but I was just like, I, I think that probably what I would have said was something along the lines of, I don't understand why these people are so, like, what is the point of us discussing people reacting to prophecies? Because we don't, like we don't do have, that. You mean we don't have prophecies? We don't have like an analog for that. Like, I understand the, the stakes within the context of the story. Yeah. But I feel like then I was like, shouldn't we be discussing the things that, exit the context of the story into right. our lives, like right. not fate versus free will, but instead family obligations mm. or the conflict between ritual and legalism or something. There are lots of things going on in Antigone. It's a rich text. Yeah. But we're spending a lot of time talking about fate versus free will. Uh-huh. And I was like, this is... Yeah. I mean, This is silly. That's not That's not the part that I'm interested in. And the teacher's like, well, 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 well. Like, okay, what I'm talking about is the fact that some people are born in families with different amounts of income, you know? Yeah. And I was like, well, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. I feel like I similarly, when we were discussing fate versus free will in high school, was very bored with the question of is there fate or is there free will? Yeah. And more concerned with the question of what do we do about the fact that we only have control over so many things, period. Yeah. Which is why I am currently really enjoying reading The King Must Die, which is one of Daphne's favorite books and has been recommended to me by her and by other people so many times that I finally was like, okay, I really, really, really have to read it right now. So I'm and in the, the middle of it. Free will versus... Well, it's the story. It's a retelling of Theseus. So obviously is there's... Is it mostly focused on the, the dad then? Are we going to spoil Theseus? Ooh. <laughs> no, it's, there's, it's, it's his entire life it's his entire story. Life. Yeah. Okay. But... <laughs> there, I just came across this one really beautiful. I mean, I shared it on our on our social, so it's not like I'm spoiling the story of Theseus, but <laughs> there's a great line where he is sort of deciding to offer himself up to Crete to mm -hmm. go be a bull dancer, where he realizes like his whole life he's been like, oh, like what's my fate? Like I need to like I need to do you know, my hero story, like very Percy book three vibes, and mm. he eventually feels like he hears the voice of Poseidon telling him he knows what he needs to do. And he says, the consenting sets one free. Yeah, that's profound. It was beautiful to me. And that's what I feel like, speak of waiting for Godot and like all these other texts that were so important to us in high school in particular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's so much less about whether or not free will exists and more like you only have so much free will. What are you going to do with it? Yeah. And how are you going to accept the things that you have no control over? Which is also <laughs> yielding. <laughs> How are you going to yield? Yeah. 
And this is post Percy's discovery of yielding. So I think it would have also been very funny if he woke up startled in class and went, oh, yielding. (laughs) 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 That was a big tangent. Anyway. (laughs) Anyway, Percy gets called to the office to go see his aunt, which of course, it's not a mortal. Sally doesn't have a sister. (laughs) This is some goddess here to ask something of him. Okay. To Percy, it's some goddess. To some of us, it's not just some goddess, right? Percy okay, is so... Okay, he doesn't so, know who it is at that point. But he's, but he's so a little... nonchalant about it being Hecate. It's so... Sometimes, you know when you get, like, slapped in the face with remembering that Percy is just, like, a 17-year-old boy? I don't, okay, I don't know if he's nonchalant. It's a strong reaction, but he's not... He's not celebrating. He's not He's not gagging, particularly, for Hecate. But he's impressed. It's not like he doesn't respect her. Should we read her, like, her introduction character description? Yeah, let's do it. I think it's page four. Inside, Dr. Samuels sat motionless at her desk, her eyes glassy. Next to her stood a middle-aged woman in a dark sleeveless gown. A chain of diamonds glittered around her neck. Her hair was a thicket of black tufts, wreathed in a halo of green fire. Ah, good, said the woman in black. She glanced at the principal. You may leave us now. Her onyx eyes glittered. She sat forward and laced her fingers, looking more like a principal than my real principal ever did. You may call me the torchbearer, the star walker, the night wanderer, the disturber of the dead, the daughter of Perseus and Asteria, the triple goddess. Uh huh. I said, still <laughs> clueless. <laughs> And, and he was right because he goes on to say, you're probably thinking, Percy, you've been dealing with the Greek gods for years. How could you not know her? That is exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> also, just because in terms of like Greek gods and goddesses that have like lots of cultural permeation. Today. Today, yeah. I would think that Hecate would be one of them. But I guess not everybody watched The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. Not everyone was sad. For the Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. <laughs> it's, it's true. Many, many people were not, in fact, Sometimes, sad. And I forget that. And when I remember that, it's so annoying. <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing that was surprising about this, and that some people were discussing when the title for this book was released, is the fact that Hazel, of course, had extended interactions with Hecate yeah. in well, the House of Hades. Percy goes on to say on page six, my tongue turned to sand. I'd never formally met Hecate, but I knew her work. I remembered her from such hits as, I joined Kronos during the Battle of Manhattan, but then switched sides. And I helped your friend Hazel fight a giant, but only after I knew the giants would lose. Hecate had always struck me as a team player, as soon as she knew which team would win. Shade. Shade? This is the first time ever I think I've been like, whoa, Percy, better be careful what you say. <laughs> Because I actually, like, like and respect the idea of Hecate. So I'm yeah. like, Percy, you better watch your mouth. Like, <laughs> Aside from when, yeah, also when he's talking shade about Athena. It's kind of a similar vibe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that, but Percy has a more generalized impudence, you know? It, it kind of is uh, available for all. I remembered something my girlfriend Annabeth had once told me. Always count to five before saying something in anger to a divine being. I managed to count to two. <laughs> I was trying to remember if that was something we've actually seen her say to him. This sounds familiar to me. Right? I don't remember it. Though. I don't remember in As particular. A between the two of them? If you remember it, let, let us know. Because I feel kind of like maybe this is something that actually did happen in a piece of dialogue before that we've read. And if not, obviously it could have. Yes. So one of the things that Hecate shares really quickly is that <laughs> a bunch of Olympians that we know and that Percy has long standing relationships with have been trying to give him quests for the past month that are gimmies gems easy money because eudora put that like help wanted ad yes, out yes. right on mount olympus and so it, it's people who we we believe would want to just like sail percy through the process like hermes said something aphrodite said something Ugh, lynn would write him two wreck letters <laughs> but hesky has been stopping all of that i feel like to me this is uh lampshading this is rick saying okay percy did all this stuff clearly some of the gods like him why why aren't they just pushing him through mm-hmm like, Hermes is a really obvious one where, like, they had that whole conversation where Percy was like, I believe you can change and it's not your fault that your son died <laughs> tragically to save a Western civilization. <gasps> After that, wouldn't you as a divine being be like, okay, yeah, I can write that kind of wreck letter. Like, he, he's done enough. Hermes is the only one I really think that that would work with. I don't know. You don't think Hera would be like... No. He, he's I don't think she feels enough remorse. <laughs> I don't think she feels remorse, but I think she would be like... Well, I like know, I know about you. I don't need to learn more information. I super don't think Hera would do that. Absolutely not. I think Hermes is the only god who we've seen be characterized as being 
personable enough with Percy and vulnerable enough with Percy to like do him a favor. Apollo. But that, no, none of that has happened yet. Oh, that hasn't happened, hasn't happened yet. So he's like in weird, maybe, is he in prison or something basically at this point? Like he, he, Apollo's like in trouble at the end of Blood of Olympus already, right? Yeah. And this is before Trials. So something weird is Yeah, Apollo's unavailable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I think it makes sense. Yeah. Just being like, he had three weeks of nothingness because Hecate because Hest- wanted him. Not Hestia. Oh my God. Hecate. It's going to happen a lot. Hecate. <laughs> Hecate wanted him. Because Halloween is coming up and she needs to go be a girl boss around the world. This was my favorite line. Where <laughs> Percy, where has or like, not has to, goddamn. Where Hecate says that she is going to wander the world on Halloween accepting people's different tributes to her. <laughs> and Percy basically is like, do you think that Hecate thinks that the trick-or-treating is, is all for her. Like, do you think... Per- Percy interprets that to be that Hecate doesn't know what trick-or-treating is, and she thinks that people are leaving out the candy specifically just for her to grab and not for all children to grab. On the one hand, this was some god-level narcissism. On the other hand, who was I to stand between a goddess and her Tootsie Rolls? So she needs a house sitter so she can go Santa Claus it up on Halloween. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is... I have to be honest with you. This was not necessarily the Hecate quest that I was crafting in my mind. I know. Mind. I was thinking dark, evil magic, like... I thought she was going to make them, like, kill somebody or something, <gasps> you know? <laughs> like... Yeah. Maybe... Okay, maybe not that. Or, I, like, get, gather potion ingredients. Potion. I thought it was going to be... I mean, like, not that it's not going to be witchy, because we are house-sitting. She presumably is going to have some... Spooky some stuff haunted in house. the haunted house. But my main concern at this point is, like, I hope we actually interact with her a fair amount more in this book. Mm -hmm. But we might not if she's not going to be physically present for most of the book because the whole conceit is that we are going to be somewhere that she is not. I think we're going to be interacting with the idea of Halloween and the true meaning of spooky season. Yeah, wow. Which is friendship. Yeah. (laughs) It's actually the Great Pumpkin. (laughs) The Great Pumpkin! Yeah, that's kind of... It might be a little bit more the Great Pumpkin than the mansion of night. You know, (laughs) we have experienced sort of the ultimate haunted house before in Percy Jackson. That's true. That's true. We've seen Percy already be forced by a a dark female force to, uh, you know, manipulate poisons and kill people. Yeah, this isn't dark Percy. This is the great pumpkin, Charlie Brown. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yes. Well, that's that's the deal, basically. She needs a house sitter for her pole cat. And her hellhound. The pole cat we've met already. Gail. The pole cat <gasps> oh from Hazel's POV is god. very famous I totally for forgot about really Gale. smelly farts. Oh my god. That's his whole bag. I can't believe I forgot about Gail. I feel so awful for forgetting about Gail. And that's why the name is funny, because Gail, like the wind, because he's <laughs> farting all the time. <laughs> wait, I can't wait to see Percy commentate about Gail's farts. That's going to be a real highlight of this book. <laughs> she says, um, you may bring those friends of yours, Anna and Grover Beth. I laughed. I laughed. She doesn't care about him. That's kind of an unusual mispronunciation because Grover Beth is uh, really not a name. But isn't but he God so bless. Grover Beth? Yeah. In a way. That, it's kind of beautiful. Arian is so Grover the Beth. The mistake is that she's kind of blending them into one person and not clipping and cutting the, the names up in the right way. Mm-hmm. Also, we've confirmed at this point, Percy <laughs> asks for dual credit in the event that there are any other gods involved. And she says, oh, that would be necessary. There will be no other gods. There will be no other gods involved. You will not get dual credit. Don't even worry about it. We will be getting a third book. Yeah, just in case you were (laughs) concerned, there's still going to be a third book. And Percy's a little bit pissed, but then very fun. She does her three distinct goddess shimmering images thing where she appears as the maiden and the mother and the crone. And Percy gets a little spooked, as he should. This is where the chapter name comes from, is that he alludes to maybe... Maybe make a poo The language is a little little vague. Uh, Little poo Soiling himself. Little pee-pee. Um... (laughs) Not all is well um, in the in the um, underwear cleanliness department. Was it the Chalice of the Gods or was it the first... I think it was the first couple books of Trials of Apollo where our friend Robert in particular was like, there's so many pee and fart and poop jokes right now. <laughs> is, it, is it that there's more than usual or is it that we're older now and really noticing how many pee, fart, and poop jokes there are in Rick's books? <laughs> this is no exception. Yeah. Beautiful. She shows the triple goddess form, which is on the cover of the book. Well, there's like two versions. There's Maiden Mother Crone, of course. And then there is the, the horse, horse, the, the lion, lion, and the, and hound. the hound. Yeah. Oh, my. This is a big year for naming the Maiden Mother Crone archetype. Absolutely it is. Absolutely. I think we have to do our Patreon episode 
about the maiden mother chrono no <laughs> oh, on oh, just agatha on agatha Okay, yeah. Patreon right. October is going to be Agatha all along. Yay. Where they famously say, Maiden Mother, Mother Crone, Crone, at the end of the song. <laughs> Maiden Mother Crone. And it sounds kind of like the opening chant to the Frozen musical because it's the same writers. <laughs> oh, it's the Lopez's? They wrote Disney. Agatha all along. Wait, what? Yeah. Like the screenplay? The no, teleplay? song. Oh, oh, the song. Right. All right. So tonight, Percy's got to go house it. Even yes. though he had plans. So now we have to tell Annabeth and Grover. After he changes his underpants. Yeah. Okay. She seems cool. Do we like her? I think we like her. It's so, this is a classic case of how do you divorce your own cultural understanding of this like iconic Greek mythological figure from what we are simply receiving in the book? Mm -hmm. Either way, I think I like her. She doesn't, Rick, I don't feel like actually is imposing a super strong take on her in this book. There's not a clear lens on her modernization. Not certainly. yet. Yeah. Yeah. Like everything she said that could, I mean, other than I guess Halloween as a North American holiday involving candy. Yeah. Everything else is kind of not locked into any particular time period or cultural context. Yeah. Or, well, she does live in New York City, which is interesting. I guess that is interesting. And she, do we know yet where the location Isn't is? Isn't it Gramercy? Isn't that the whole point? I don't know if they said that yet. Oh. Have they? We find out in We find out two. really soon. Yeah. That she lives in Gramercy Park. Or that she at least has a mansion in Gramercy Park. Yeah. I don't know. It's not particularly witchy to me, but I could see the whole brownstone vibe. She's been upscale. As Agatha all along will tell us, there are many ways you could sort of conceptualize a modern day witch, be it psychic or wellness guru. <laughs> so yeah, we don't have necessarily one of Hot those topic employee. Yet. Hot topic employee. <laughs> <sighs> That's my favorite, actually. <laughs> Okay, chapter two. Grover gets heavily caffeinated. This chapter opens with, fun fact, said Grover, obscure knowledge is called trivia because Hecate's Roman name. Trivia. Three roads. That may be a fact, I said, but it's not fun. I enjoyed that. I thought it was a fun fact. I thought it was a fun fact too. And again, I know that we've harped on this over and over and over again, but in case you're new here at the podcast, this Grover is so not the same as the original <laughs> Grover. Like, I truly believe in my heart that the original Pentology Grover was simply not this upbeat. Like, I don't think that he was this positive vibes necessarily. I don't think that's just me being a former revised Grover hater. I do think that Aryan's voice is just so evident now. You cannot pull them apart. I don't think it's that Grover wasn't funny. He was much more anxious, definitely. Yeah, and not he... funny, just like, I mean, like, upbeat. Yeah. Carefree. Upbeat, carefree, I mean, which I, I think... That part isn't necessarily... It's not necessarily textually inconsistent, but it is true. I think that's very Aryan-infused. Certainly, this 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 take. It's very plausible to me that Grover is just in a better place in life now. That's a really good point, too. He's like a lord of the wild. He's... He has employment. He has um, not the fear of... The great prophecy. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's basically retired. He's not retired. He's like tenured. He's in his final he's tenured. job. Yeah. He, he doesn't have to struggle for anyone else's approval anymore. Whereas all of the early books were him slowly advancing along that journey of not needing things from other people anymore and not being super tenuous and in immediate danger all the time. That's such a good point. This this chapter also says, Grover danced and skipped along the sidewalk in front of me. The cooler October weather always made him perky. As soon as I'd mentioned my encounter with Hecate, he got even more excited. That is sort of the vibe of your, your eccentric professor skipping down the street. Yeah. <laughs> it's not Grover as we knew him in The Lightning Thief at all. Because he's not as preoccupied. Yes. Yeah, I think that's right. Yay. Oh, this is also very delightful to me. The description of how he's dressed on this New York fall day. His goat hooves were sort of not really concealed in a modified pair of orange Crocs. Because inconspicuous, his horns peeked through his shaggy hair. His blue hoodie was emblazoned with the word human. That's really funny. Yeah. It's quite specific. Percy's like, this doesn't look human at all. But I actually think that's, is that not how Gen Alpha dresses? I think that is an outfit that you would totally see, yeah, on the streets of New York in certain neighborhoods. 100%. Maybe not in the neighborhood we're in right now, which is in the Upper West Side, right? Upper East Side. We're on our way to see Sally. We're on our way to see Sally. So at they're the like, Cratch Teapot. Yeah, they say, we trotted down Lexington Avenue, met at 103rd Street Subway Station, our usual after-school rendezvous point, because Percy's school is uh, uh, in Queens, remember? Okay, commuter, wow. Remember he takes the F train because his school mm. is out in Queens? Yeah. Now we were going to visit my mom at her favorite cafe where she was trying to finish writing her new book. Normally, I wouldn't have interrupted her while she was working, but I figured I'd better tell her about Hecate's quest as soon as possible, etc., etc. 
The best cafe of all, the cracked teapot. This, I was low-key like, okay, chipped cup mentioned, question mark, question mark, question mark. This is for my New York, particularly <laughs> my like um, Harlem, Washington Heights girlies. The chipped cup is like a very well-known cafe around like 140th Street. Could be a coincidence just because New York is fun like that. And there's places like this all over the place. But I was like, oh my God, it seems very reflective of the chipped, the chipped cup. Probably. I have to imagine that. Even if he hasn't been there, that he would have opened up Google Maps and... Wander around neighborhoods for inspiration. Yeah. Some guests, former guests on Seaweed Brain <laughs> have been baristas at the chipped cup. <laughs> I won't dox anyone's workplace, but I think that's pretty funny. Um, I love also this this very writerly authorial insert from Rick here about what kinds of cafes you should be writing your books in. It shouldn't be a Starbucks. It should be a place with character and good coffee. Yes. Where's the true. lie? <laughs> the great description of the cafe, which again... Isn't unlike the chipped cup, personally. I want, if you also live in New York, and I know a lot of you do, tell me if you also thought about the chipped cup when you read this, because I really, I really can't stop picturing it. Even though this is, we're on the Upper East Side here, and the chipped cup is obviously on the West Side. There's also sort of a throwaway descriptive line about a large bearded dude in a pink tutu making coffee. Like the barista happens to be yeah. a large bearded dude in a dude in a tutu, and there's no extra commentary about it. Yeah. And I think I really liked that. I did enjoy it. If, if, if Percy were um, a protege of mine, I would say, well, Percy, if you see somebody wearing a tutu behind um, the bar of a barista in New York, maybe they not may a man. not be a dude. They may not be a dude, yeah. Whether or not they have a beard. Um, right. <laughs> but, then, but then Percy refers to them as the ballet dancer. So maybe yes. that's Percy clocking himself, you know? Yeah, maybe it is. I think many people feel uh, different types of ways about the gender implications of the word dude. That's so real. I do use dude as a non-gendered word, personally. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we see Sally here, and we have a beautiful description of her. Her hair is pulled back in a bun to keep it from falling in her face while she typed, it's giving messy bun. Oh, Sally. She <laughs> leaned forward, her face glowing in the light of the laptop screen, like she wanted to dive into the world she was creating. She wore a stretchy dark shirt to accommodate her baby bump and one of my stepdad's t-shirts, a black one with a picture of a dude playing a stand-up bass under the name Charles Mingus. Because Paul loves jazz, as we know. Yes, as he should. Mm -hmm. Charles Mingus, strong choice. And in case you needed the reminder, the baby bump is because Estelle hasn't been born yet because yes. this is before the trials of Apollo, <laughs> which I always forget. We're in the middle. And so Sally is effectively treating the baby as a built-in deadline to finish this current book, which would be her second. Percy and Grover arrive. Boys, she said. Sorry to barge in, Grover said. Not at all. She patted the chair next to her. Save me from this dialogue, please. I think it's trying to kill me. Love. I love having an author character in these books for Rick to put in all of his good one-liners <laughs> from being an author for so many years. <laughs> it's nice to see Sally working. Now that it we is. like didn't believe that she worked or something, but you know. Not at a candy store in a subway station. Yeah, yeah. but to like literally see it. This is also, I'm not going to lie, I screamed. This was so funny to me. Grover slid in next to her. I sat across the table. I'm always careful not to look at my mom's screen while she's writing because A, I know it makes her nervous, and B, the floating words make me queasy, and C, I can't help wondering if she's writing a character based on me. Maybe that sounds self-centered, but the idea of anybody writing a book about me makes me super paranoid. <laughs> Rick is canon in these books, though. The, as scribe, the Camp Half-Blood Scribe. Half yeah. Mm -hmm. But a scribe is different from... I'm writing a book about you. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Percy, and Percy talks about the Google Doc. He's writing the book about himself. Yes. Yeah. Or maybe we're supposed to assume this is like his diary? No. He's writing down his own story. I would love, I would love, if not in the next Senior Year Adventures book, just at some point, you know, For before. Percy to like see a Percy Jackson book? No, for <laughs> Percy to like openly state that he felt he wanted to write down his tale, you know? Mm. That he wanted to be the one to orate the story of Percy Jackson, you know, yeah. and like add that to the canon of classics and stories about Greek heroes and everything. Yeah. To like think about his I feel like at legacy. some point I could imagine him saying something like, I, I think that there are lessons for heroes to take away about yielding. humility and yielding and not dying and retiring. And I, I don't know if we're supposed to read too much into the canon implications of this. This sounds like a throwaway joke that I did laugh at. I will read so deeply into the canon implications of this. Um, the other way I will read deeply into the canon implications of this is that to me, because I'm reading it so much with Rick's sarcasm, it sounds like Percy being sarcastic. Percy like knows <laughs> that we're reading a book about him right now. Yeah. 
I kind of would like at some point later for Percy to be like, by the way, I'm a published author. This is what it Slay. means for my life. You know, yeah. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe some point later. Uh, yes. So they tell Sally what they're going to go do. And Sally, as usual, you know, Percy's like, I can tell she's stressed, but she always tries to keep, you know, a positive, upbeat tone with me. Mm-hmm. This is also the point where Grover is starting to become over-caffeinated because Percy gets a blueberry smoothie, but Grover gets a, quote, double shot latte and a strawberry muffin. But he's not so different from the caffeine because we've seen Grover house coffees a lot in the original five books. It's specifically, I think this is like a totally new out of left field piece of information, which is that Grover gets zooted off of strawberries. Well, wouldn't it be fun to go back and reread the original series and think about Grover getting zooted off of strawberries, given that he like works for the strawberry fields at Camp Half Life? Yes. <laughs> like, strawberries zooted the whole everywhere. Time? Yeah, maybe that's why he was so anxious. He was consuming too many, too many and he was just running too high. Yeah, it's like drinking too much coffee. It makes you anxious. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe. I do also just have to clarify, a double shot latte is just a latte. Um, every latte in America has two shots of espresso in it. Well, like, it's, if you want... A lot of them can produce a single shot, but that's not the default. No, yes. The default setting, if you're going to get a latte, there's going to be two shots of espresso in it. If you don't want two shots of espresso, you want to order a single shot latte, but it's going to taste milky. If you want what you're thinking as being double the amount of coffee... It's actually four shots. You want four shots. You want a quad. Just... Yes. Now you know. <laughs> now we get this, like, weird, mysterious thing where Sally has some kind of history with the Gramercy Park neighborhood. She hasn't yeah. been there in a long time. We don't know anything about it. And Percy has this really sweet line I appreciate where he says, one thing about me and my mom, she never pushes me to talk about something if I'm not ready. And I try to give her the same courtesy. So Percy's like, you know, I really want to find out what that, what's going on there, but clearly she's not going to tell me now. So I'm just going to keep it in mind. Maybe later tonight. She maybe. also trails off. She is saying something to the effect of she wants to give additional information, but maybe not right now. But it's suspicious. I do hope that we see more Sally, though. <laughs> I think we will. That seems like what we're yeah. setting up, right? It's also, speaking of the influences of the TV show onto these books, like, there's so much more Sally in the show, and there's also mm. so much more Sally in these books. Yeah, yeah. And I personally, I attribute that to Becky. And I know people have also attributed that to Becky before, that she was like, we need more Sally, period. Mm, yeah. yeah. They're speculating about this, and we also would know this, that Hecate has a particularly strong association with the mess. She's kind of the goddess of the mess. That's what she worked on with Hazel. Sally is famously somebody who can really, really see through the mist. It's like Sally and Rachel Elizabeth Dare and Mae Castellan as these icons of being mortals who are mysteriously, inexplicably undeterred, unconfused by the mist. Mm-hmm. So maybe Sally knows about what's down there. It seems like maybe she has run upon Hecate, perhaps, in Gramercy yeah. Park. Or some super spooky haunted house. Or a super and spooky haunted back. house where she could see everything that was going on. Yeah. Exactly. Something like that. Well. Well. We'll have to find out. Yeah. Annabeth next chapter. Annabeth next chapter. Yay! Oh my god, I'm so excited for Annabeth next chapter and Annabeth's shady friends. I can't wait. It's gonna be it's gonna be so fulfilling. I am so into Annabeth's shady friends. <laughs> Me too! Hana, Annabeth's shady friend. Talk, I've never identified more with the character in Percy Jackson than Hana, Annabeth's shady friend. We say a lot about Percy and how he might enter our lives, and I think most likely it would be as the boyfriend we don't like. I completely <laughs> Like somebody who were like, oh, you've known her for longer, but we know her more and more truly. And and I bet you can't even talk to her about how you would redesign the mat, huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that'll be for next week. Thank you for joining us. Happy book birthday to The Wrath of the Triple Goddess, as well as the official Percy Jackson cookbook, the paperback copy of The Sun and the Star, and the graphic novel adaptation of The House of Hades. All of these books came out yesterday. We will be back next week to talk about the next chapters. We'll have to think of a fun question. Um, what are you dressing up as for Halloween? Are you the maiden mother of the crone? Oh, like who do you identify as the maiden mother of the crone? <laughs> We're the crones, obviously. Crones, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> okay, until next time, y'all. See you later. Bye. Bye, y'all.